Uh, so I want to welcome you to the Going Viral session uh, covering coronavirus flu and other contagious illness without creating hysteria. This event really was thought up and pulled off very quickly. It was thought up by the graduate student Laura Fuchs, who was um, <clears throat> came to a Society of Professional Journalists meeting. We were talking about our events for the semester, and she said, "Hey, we should get on this." And it correl it, it is is uh, along the lines of the research that she's doing for her master's thesis. So we all jumped on it, and we feel pretty proud that we pulled together this absolutely wonderful panel. Um, and I'm just going to introduce our moderator, Susan Swanberg, and she'll be introducing each speaker um, briefly as they uh, before they present. The agenda is that each speaker will present for about three to five minutes, just talk about whatever they want to around the issue of coronavirus. Then Susan will direct questions to the panel, either individually or to the full panel. And then we're gonna open it up to questions. And if you, um, we'll hand out some cards, and if you have a question, we'll have you write your question on a card, wave it in the air, we'll come around and get it, and that way we can triage. That's the healthcare word. Thank you. Triage. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Susan Swanberg is a professor in the School of Journalism, and she's moderating tonight. She's a former criminal lawyer and bench scientist who conducted research uh, in tele, how do you say that? Telomere. Telomere, biology and autism genetics. She's now an assistant professor of journalism at the University of Arizona School of Journalism, where she teaches news reporting, science writing, science journalism, uh, research methods, things like that, environmental journalism and media law. And so I will turn this over to Susan and she will decide whatever order she wants to go in. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. Yeah. Really appreciate it. We're Susan Squared. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. So what I'm going to do first, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of information about the protocol. I'm going to briefly introduce um, the panel, just their name and their title, and then get a, give a little bit more about their bio um, right before they give their remarks. So first, to my right, is um, Dr. Bob England, who spent several decade, decades working in public health. Don't say several decades. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite that old. <laughs> Susan. That was pretty close to four. That's yeah. several. <laughs> yeah. If we're going to talk about My accuracy. information is from <laughs> Professor Knight. <laughs> anyway, you worked in public health for a long time. You're now currently interim director of the Pima County Health Department. And then to the right is our very talented Stephanie Innes, who we miss terribly. Um, she's now the healthcare reporter for the Arizona Republic and previously worked for the um, Arizona Daily Star in Tucson as the health reporter. Thank you for being here. And next is Laura Fuchs, who will be the first speaker. Um, she's a graduate student at the University of Arizona, formerly a geneticist, who did clinical genetics, and um, she's going to basically give the introductory talk. Next to um, Laura is David, Dr. David Solovsky, who's the interim co-executive director and the director of health promotion and preventive services at the University of Arizona Campus Health Services. So we have a remarkable panel here today. Thank you all for joining us, and we look forward to comments. So each panelist will give a brief introduction, and then we'll have a series of questions. So first, let's have Laura Fuchs for okay. the presentation. And would you like to mind? Um, I think I'm good. Can you guys all hear me? Well, you need it for the... Okay. Uh, we need it for the recording, yeah. 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 Thank okay. you. Okay, and is my voice loud enough? Yeah, to, yeah. Okay. I will pass. And Laura, you can just... Uh, the clickers were all checked out by the Maker Center, and so you can just signal to me, and I will click forward through your slides. <clears throat> well, um, thank you guys for coming. 
I may take a little more than five minutes since my PowerPoint presentation. I think it's going to be a little bit educational. What I'm really looking for are some ideas from you guys. So one of the reasons I started doing this was because I was interested last semester in the link between, the non-link between MMR and autism. And then the coronavirus came out and school started and I decided to go ahead and do this project. So. To give you a little history, I don't know how much you guys know about coronavirus, but the CDC has an excellent website. So my my project right now is a, is basically a work in process, uh, progress, and how the New York Times, Washington Post, and San Francisco Chronicle reported the new coronavirus from January 2020 to December 2020. So it's going to be a year-long content analysis, and I have a method set up almost, um, and choosing a content analysis as a schemata for that and going through a code book. And those are all the things that I still have to do. So I'm only, what, six weeks into this project and doing research, so bear with me if I am not apparently quite ready for prime time, as we say, <laughs> to frame it that way. So if you want to go to the next slide. So this was one of the first pictures that I found, and this was um, in the New York Times, but I started picking up keywords. So all the keywords there, coronavirus, COVID-19, pandemic, and epidemic outbreak, SARS, MERS, CDC, who, you can keep going on, but um, these are all some words that <coughs> seem to be coming up quite frequently. Um, some of the words that may not be familiar might be zoonosis. Um, that's when, a, say, coronavirus uh, jumps from a bat or a camel to a human. So it goes from one critter to a human. Um, and so that's coming up. And a lot of the words are like war, battle, fight. So I just started picking those up. If you want to go to the next one. So this is my preliminary code scheme. And these are just questions. It's not a code book. It's not anything that other than looking at some, some of the way to go ahead and code something. So is a quoted person an expert or non-expert? Um, getting to the point where is the person identified it as an expert within the newspaper story? So, so and so from CDC said, uh, hopefully they'll be considered as an expert. Um, you know, the, I was doing research on SARS and MERS, and um, SARS was also described as mysterious. Mysterious comes up a lot. Um, is it a pandemic, an epidemic, or an outbreak? And fear and panic are. Uh, in the headlines, mass, xenophobia, stigma. So I have a whole slideshow here of uh, newspaper stories that have come up in the last six weeks. I, last most recent one was from yesterday. I can't stop myself from collecting a mm -hmm. corpus. That's of okay, you got 10 more months to do it. Articles, um, okay, and so focus, actors, and is it going to end? So uh, we can go to the next slide. Is there a way you can play the top one? The, um, it's, this is on coronaviruses. This is uh, the WHO has a really awesome video. I think it's an awesome. Um, I think one of the important things is to explain this to kids. So I'm hoping that this information actually gets passed down so that. In December 2019, there was a cluster of pneumonia cases in China. Investigations found that it was caused by a previously unknown virus, now named the 2019 novel coronavirus. In this video, We'll take a quick look at what's currently known about the virus. Keep in mind that this is a new virus, and what's known about the virus now might change in the future. Coronaviruses are a large group of viruses. They consist of a core of genetic material surrounded by an envelope with protein spikes. This gives it the appearance of a crown. Crown in Latin is called corona, and that's how these viruses get their name. There are different types of coronaviruses that cause respiratory and sometimes gastrointestinal symptoms. Respiratory disease can range from the common cold to pneumonia, and in most people, the symptoms tend to be mild. However, there are some types of coronaviruses that can cause severe disease. These include the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus, first identified in China in 2003, and the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus that was first identified in Saudi Arabia in 2012. The 2019 novel coronavirus was first identified in China. It initially occurred in a group of people with pneumonia who'd been associated with a seafood and live animal market in the city of Wuhan. 
The disease has since spread from those who were sick to others, including family members and healthcare staff. There are many cases at present, and the disease has spread within China and also to a number of other countries. So, where did the virus come from? It's known that coronaviruses circulate in a range of animals. Sometimes these viruses can make the jump from animals to humans. This is called a spillover and could be due to a range of factors, such as mutations in the virus or increased contact between humans and animals. For example, MERS-CoV is known to be transmitted from camels and SARS-CoV from civet cats. The animal reservoir of the 2019 novel coronavirus is not known yet. How is it transmitted? The exact dynamics of how the virus is transmitted is yet to be determined. In general, respiratory viruses are usually transmitted through droplets created when an infected person coughs or sneezes or through something that has been contaminated with the virus. People most at risk of infection from the novel coronavirus are those in close contact with animals, such as live animal market workers, and those who are caring for people infected with the virus, such as family members or healthcare workers. So, how does the disease present? Well, from what is known so far, there can be a number of symptoms ranging from mild to severe. There can be fever and respiratory symptoms such as cough and shortness of breath. In more severe cases, there's been pneumonia, kidney failure, and death. The mortality rate is not known yet. How can we tell whether someone is infected? The infection can be diagnosed by a test called PCR, or polymerase chain reaction. This test identifies the virus based on its genetic fingerprint. There is currently no specific medication for the virus, and treatment is supportive care. There is currently no vaccine to protect against the virus. Treatment and vaccines are in development. How do we prevent transmission of the virus? This new virus currently has a limited geographic spread. However, there are a number of standard hygiene practices that have been recommended to protect against infection and further spread. These include covering your mouth and nose when coughing or sneezing with a medical mask, tissue, or flexed elbow, avoiding close contact with those who are unwell, the appropriate use of masks and personal protective equipment, especially in a healthcare setting, washing hands regularly with soap and water or alcohol-based hand rub. Actions that can be taken to prevent infection from an animal source include avoiding unnecessary unprotected contact with animals, washing hands after contact with animals or animal products, and ensuring that animal products are cooked thoroughly before they're consumed. It's important to stay home if you're feeling unwell, but if you have a fever, cough, and difficulty breathing, seek medical care early and share your previous travel history with your healthcare provider. That's a quick look at this emerging infectious disease. Given that this outbreak is evolving rapidly, what's known about this virus can change. Please check the websites below for the most up-to-date information. Okay, um, I thought that was a pretty good one from all the information that I've uncovered so far. So if you want to go to the next one, the only thing about this, uh, I think it was done in January, it was January, it was mid-January, mid to late January. So this morning I saw a little blip on the news that the coronavirus is in every single country, continent, except Antarctica. Mm -hmm. I saw that as well. Yeah. That's really? crazy. <clears throat> oh. By now, oh, you've probably heard of COVID-19, or coronavirus disease discovered in 2019, which is responsible for a global okay. pandemic. Thus far, the main country affected has been China, but it spread to a number of other countries around the world to a varying degree. The virus was initially referred to as the 2019 NCOV, or the 2019 novel coronavirus, and was informally called the Wuhan coronavirus. The World Health Organization named the disease. So, but we could go to the next one. Next slide. Um, because, yeah. Not next video. Slide. Sorry. <laughs> so, this is one of the, in the Washington Post, January 27th. One of the things that I was trying to find are the articles that came out in the New York Times and the Washington Post and the San Francisco Chronicle didn't seem to start appearing until the second week in January. So we got to the point where the WHO was contacted by China on December 31st, when we were all celebrating New Year's, um, 
and then the word finally got out, I guess, into the newspapers, but not until the, like the second week in January. So it's been kind of difficult to to track back and the whole um, issue with the Chinese and not reporting the, you know, the the outbreak, the virus, whatever it is. Um, there was a technician on December 26th who supposedly discovered that there was no genetic match. It was like 78% close to SARS. So this, that's how they identified that they, they actually had a new virus. But um, the point about this is I'm looking in my content analysis about um, keywords and panic words and you know things about skyrocketing and swiftly spreading, um, talking about the basic reproductive number and then telling people that scientists don't agree precisely on what the basic reproductive number is. And this was one of the early um, maps um, coming out of um, China. So there are conflicting information, conflicting information, um, it seems like daily. So if you want to go to the next one. And this is when uh, people were trying to get out, were like refugees. Americans departing virus hit Wuhan, criticized US government. Um, also looking at if articles are pro-government, anti-government, um, that's one of the things I'm looking at for content analysis. And then we have then the deadly coronavirus um, outbreak went into lockdown. So I've highlighted, obviously, in yellow, some of the keywords that I'm looking for. Um, so if you want to go to the next one. OK, so this came out in the Washington Post February 7th. And coronavirus came from bats or possibly pangolins. I think that's the way you say it, amid acceleration of new zoonotic infections. Um, they really haven't found, I got on the CDC website yesterday and they really don't know what animal it came from, but um, the poor little pangolin eater, um, I hope that um, they're safe wherever they are um, and <coughs> not being imported into China. Um, so load again, loaded with mysteries and um, global health crisis, zoonosis, all these keywords. So the ability for pathogens, including bacteria and viruses, to enter the human population. So there's a little bit of science explanation in there. I'm also looking at how much science explanation are, are in newspaper articles. So next one. Okay, so San Francisco airport, SFO, screens for new virus from China. Um, again, it's mysterious. And the um, uh, Dr. Nancy Messonnier, I think that's how you say her name, from the CDC, uh, she came out, this was January 20th, um, she's saying that the uh, virus so far appears less dangerous. We believe the current risk from this virus to the general public is low. For a family sitting around the dinner table tonight, this is not something that they generally need to worry about. And then if you go to the next slide. Um, now we go two days later, the San Francisco Chronicle, now the first case of the deadly new virus um, has become, <laughs> potential become a major global threat and now officials worldwide are racing to learn more about the new virus and how it can be stopped. So that was just two days. So you can see how rapidly things are going. Um, so again, February 1st, San Francisco Chronicle, it's mysterious again. Um, I'm also uh, doing a content analysis on how risky this is, you know, what's the degree of risk um, and how risk is explained. Um, now we have our assessment is that the public is at large, at, is still at low risk, and that's Dr. Sarah Cody, a Santa Clara County Health Officer. So um, if you want to go to the next one. And uh, we've seen this um, in the newspaper. This was in the New York Times on January 31st. Um, the headline, this virus has sent off some panic bells for me, said Sarah Lynn, 22, a junior at Arizona State PMP. So the global alarm now over the coronavirus is particularly intense on American college campuses. Um, you know, you've got a campus like University of Arizona or ASU or any of the large campuses around the country and, you know, people are in close contact, but, you know, you're in dormitories and now students are packed tightly and illnesses can sweep through dormitories and classrooms. So all these keywords kind of come up. So if you want to go to the next one. Okay, masks are on, games are canceled, and the coronavirus comes to U.S. colleges. Again, um, did anybody see the tweet in Cal State Berkeley's tweet about um, common reactions to the coronavirus? I don't know if you guys saw this or not. No? Um, the last one there is uh, common reactions with xenophobia, fears about interacting with those who might be from Asia and guilt about these feelings. 
um, they took this down in about 24 hours. But this was in the New York Times, and of course I go down a lot of rabbit holes, and so I clicked on it, and they still, you can still get that image. I'm not sure if it's still available, but I grabbed it when I could get it. Um, so if you want to go to the next one. Chinese doctor silenced after warning of outbreak, dies from coronavirus. This was a big deal. The other thing I thought about doing is um, trying to, there are so many articles coming out. You guys probably have seen a whole bunch of them. Um, there are some key dates, like when the virus was named. Another key date is when Dr. Li um, died and talking about the epidemic and um, there should be more openness and transparency. transparency. So a healthy society should not have just one voice. So the next slide. Well, now we had the uh, Diamond Princess cruise ship. Uh, I keep hearing painful coughs. Life on a quarantine cruise ship. Um, there were other articles about this, about dread, about the long days ahead. So um, I don't know if you guys heard, but there are, I think there are over 100 now. I know it was up to 98. I don't know if anybody else has any statistics, but um, some of the people got off the ship and um, could and we're tested positive for the coronavirus later on. So if you want to go to the next one. Okay, a new martyr puts a face on China's deepening coronavirus crisis. Again, talking about censorship, propaganda. We're talking about, you know, government China now. Um, this is in the New York Times, February 7th, in the World Asia China section. I'm also keeping track of where these um, articles are in the paper. If they're on the front page, if they're in the world section, there's Asia um, health section, there's business section. Um, so I'm keeping track of that. Um, if you want to go to the next one. Okay, Tokyo Marathon restricted to elite athletes over coronavirus outbreak. Um, this was one of the first articles that I found that a uh, large sport event, um, you know, we know the Tokyo Olympics are coming up, then um, they're talking about that. That's still kind of up in the air, the last I heard, but they have a couple months to decide what they're gonna do. Um, this was one of the better ones. The only reason I picked putting this up today is because it says that the elephant in the room is looming. The Olympic torch relay is scheduled to begin next month. So framing um, the coronavirus as the elephant in the room is looming, I thought was a pretty interesting phrase. So if I'm going to go to the next one. Um, World health officials now have a name. So here we go, New York Times. Uh, the WHO actually named it on February 11th. Um, so the New York Times came out with that. We have a name now. So I sent a little note. I went on to the CDC, uh, the WHO website last night. So the virus has been named SARS-CoV-2, and the disease it causes has been named Coronavirus Disease 2019, abbreviated COVID-19. The reason I picked this out was, it seems like everyone's talking about it as coronavirus, but it has a name. And we all saw that the coronavirus can be caused, um, the common cold is a coronavirus. So going back and looking at this and seeing what reporters use the word coronavirus and who use COVID-19, it seems like COVID-19 was used for a while and now everybody's talking, the reports are coming out with just coronavirus, coronavirus, coronavirus. So um, I'm, tracking, I'm tracking to see who uses what word. I really like this photo. So this is one of the hospitals in China. Uh, this is New York Times, February 18th. The new virus is deadlier than the one that causes the flu. And the epidemiologists out there might want to take a look at this. And I want to see what you guys think of this slide. It's all in the math. It's all in how you add it up. So point of story, fatality rate of 2.3%. Um, I calculated the last night, I think it's closer to 2.5 now, but that's a plus or minus. Um, <clears throat> flu fatality rates hover around 0.1%. Okay. Does anyone, you do the math? Do you want to do the math on that? There are 80,000 cases of coronavirus. I'm pointing to Denise because she's a math person. <laughs> and if the mortality right now is, uh, so it's like 20, 25, 2700 people have died. I'm looking at you because I don't know if you're <laughs> not not not. Flu. Okay, yeah, of the um, coronavirus. So the flu fatality rate are about 3,000 deaths from coronavirus. Yeah, so we're close to that. So now flu fatality rates hover around 0.1%. If you look at the number of people that actually get the flu and you multiply by 0 0.1, 
there are going to be 20 times as many people die from the flu as COVID-19, if you really do the math. And headline on this one might say, 20 times as many people die from the flu as COVID-19, if you were to reframe it. <laughs> so that was just really amazing. It took me a little while to do the math, but I did do it. And so we can go back and check in on that. The Health 202, um, the Washington Post, February 19th, this is just last week, uh, they have that running a Health 202 now, day by day. Drug makers are developing a coronavirus vaccine. That's a sign the disease will be around a long time, okay? Now we have risking a lot of money. We've gone from risking a deadly disease to risking a lot of money. So what are we framing here? That's my question. So if you want to go to the next one. Great photo, San Marco Square in Venice. This is just uh, New York Times, February 23rd. In the world, Europe, Italy section. Italy battles to contain Europe's first major outbreak of coronavirus. So apparently the government officials have scrambled on Sunday to contain the first major outbreak of the coronavirus in Europe, locking down at least 10 towns near Milan. We're trying to contain a phenomenon, not a pandemic. I like the word phenomenon. We're trying to contain a phenomenon, but it's not a pandemic. Mr. Gallery of the health official for Lombardi said, okay? So if you want to go to the next one, I almost want to, I want to get people's reactions from this. Um, this is really, so I felt like crying. Coronavirus shakes China's expecting mothers. Um, I have a friend who's a genetic counselor and I did ask her about the coronavirus and pregnancy. And so that's the number one thing on pregnant mothers' minds is what the coronavirus is going to do. Well, probably in the top 10. So does anybody have an idea? Should we worry about it? Should we have this article in the paper? I understand why this is in here because there's a doctor shortage now in China and women are showing up to clinics and hospitals and there's no one there to help them or treat them. She had to wait a really long time uh, I don't feel at ease. Um, or Lu, Lu, who is five months pregnant with her first child after waiting for three hours. This is Lou Brighton, who saw the doctor. For a brief 10 minute conversation, his advice is stop reading the news. So I thought that was kind of an interesting comment. <laughs> so she's actually bought her um, baby clothes. Uh, they are masks and goggles for protection against the coronavirus. So they have little baby child masks now. <laughs> Which is kind of interesting. And then uh, I think we can go to the next one. So the coronavirus information on the internet, you guys have probably gone to this already. So we've got The Lancet. Um, the Lancet is actually, um, you know, a magazine that you have to pay for, the library has a subscription for it. But um, they're putting out information on the coronavirus for free. So if anybody wants to go and look at some of those papers that are coming out, um, they're kind of um, interesting. Um, Arizona Department of Health Services, World Health Organization, CDC, and then um, the last three nights in a row I've been watching Netflix, Pandemic, How to Prevent an Outbreak. Have anybody seen it? No? It's really good. It might give you a very good idea um, about what went on with SARS and MERS and Ebola. Um, they don't talk about Zika virus, but all these unknown viruses that are now probably more prevalent based on our population and how close we are and what we're consuming. Um, one of the really good things in the movie was they had a woman and she was testing wild birds. There's a lot of wild bird migra migration throughout the world. And she had hunters out there and the hunters who normally kill the birds. And so they got to hold these ducks in their hands and a lot of them were kind of like, wow, these ducks are kind of cute. I don't know if I'm gonna you know, shoot them. But the point of the story is when you eat wild game, you kind of risk a lot. But um, um, there are other um, sites that I've come across in the last couple of days that I, you know, I can share any of that with you later. But three sites that you go to, can go to for information if, if you're out about the coronavirus, and so perhaps maybe if you have any questions. All right, thank you. Thank you.
So now what we are going to do is have our other panelists give a brief background on uh, what they think is important to know about COVID-19. And first I will turn um, to Dr. Bob England, who as I mentioned earlier, is the interim director of the Pima County Health Department. Thank you so much for being with us. Sure, absolutely. So um, I'm, I'm gonna talk more from a what's actually going on perspective. Um, so far, we are following CDC's lead in doing everything that they suggest in guidelines, which amounts to um, interviewing returning travelers, classifying people based on risk, certain people being quarantined at home for 14 days if they're at high enough risk, and actually getting a few people tested, uh, even who came back from a place or had been exposed to somebody with um, with the novel coronavirus who had symptoms, no positives yet, everything's been negative. Um, but that won't work very long. So what do we know about this? One, we know it's quite contagious, or you wouldn't have seen the numbers explode as fast as you did in, in more than one location. Two, we know that it's usually mild um, and sometimes asymptomatic completely, and that's probably a lot more common than we know about. Um, we know that transmission has occurred even from people who are asymptomatic, and that probably happens a lot more often than we know about. Those, can, those characteristics make trying to do really aggressive control efforts like isolating people and quarantining everybody who's been around them likely to fail in the long run. Um, it makes sense right now when you're trying to keep the introduction of a virus into your community. It buys you time, but eventually plenty of people who are mild or no symptoms are going to slip through that and eventually you'll have community transmission. We also know um, that the number of infections in the places where it's spreading is probably way, way, way higher than we know about. Think about this. That's good and bad. That's bad in that it emphasizes how contagious this thing is. But it's really good when you start talking about mortality rates. Um, we find out only about one case out of probably about 50 cases of flu every year in this community in this country because most people who get the flu don't go seek care. Even a lot of people who go seek care won't get tested and the only ones who get reported are the folks who are sick enough, they got tested and they got reported as, as positives. That's all we know about. Well, that's what the basis of the numbers coming out of China and elsewhere are too. In all likelihood, a vastly large number of people are having mild or or, or no symptoms aren't getting counted at all. So think about this. If you take that 50-fold estimate, and it's even anywhere close to that, and you increase the size of the denominator of the number of patients by that, you get a mortality rate that's pretty similar to the flu. And that's really important because we don't close schools close businesses, disrupt transportation, cancel events, and so forth every flu season for the flu. You know, two years ago, we lost 80,000 Americans to run-of-the-mill seasonal flu. That's more than a couple of hundred people here in Pima County probably died because of the flu. Um, I would expect once this thing gets around, it's really gonna get around, it's going to infect a lot of people, but it's going to feel like a bad flu season. So we are poised to do way more harm to ourselves than this virus will. Because earlier this week, CDC was out saying, get ready. It's, it's pull out your pandemic preparedness plans and um, expect for schools to be closed, expect businesses to be closed, expect extreme control measures like they've introduced in China. And that would be the exact wrong thing to do. And since this is a, a journalism uh, group, 
Um, from a communication standpoint, that's atrocious because we'll be sending loud and clear a message that this is way more dire than it actually is. And it's not, I don't mean to downplay the people who are gonna die, there will be lots of people die before this thing is over, but it's going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of what you see with the bad flu season. Um, so instead of doing all that stuff, we need to ramp up our education about washing your hands, keeping your hands away from your face, all that stuff that you saw on the other. We need to do what we can to support a healthcare system that's gonna be really freaking busy, sorry, um, but it <laughs> will be. Um, we need to be prepared for changes, but we've got to stop saying and doing things that hype this. It's not, you know, a lot of people in my business blame the media all the time when things get hyped. This is not the media hyping stuff. They're looking at what's actually being done. This is a story full of hype. Um, and some of the statements we've made here are just making that um, even worse. I wanna tell you one hopeful thing. So in the 2009 pandemic, I gotta tell you a quick story, do I have two more minutes? Yes. 2009 flu pandemic. I remember this way too well. I was running Maricopa County Department of Public Health at the time. The first news broke on a Friday afternoon. If you remember, many of you guys won't, <laughs> but I certainly do. The news reports at that time coming out of Mexico were really dire. There were stories of lots of people in the hospital, young people dying in droves, all sorts of horrible um, sounding media. <coughs> By that weekend, the CDC had put out, among other things, guidance that said, if you get one case of flu in a school, close the school. One case of this is not one flu. This is in April. So sure enough, Maricopa County, by Tuesday of that first week, we had a case and I closed the first school. By Thursday, we had two more and I had closed three schools. But we looked around and we had upwards of 100 tests in the pipeline that had tested at the state lab positive for H1 coming out of school. So it was obvious it was all over the ballot. So it made zero sense to close a given school here and there based on where people happen to be able to obtain testing, right? <clears throat> so um, we had two choices. We closed all the schools or we say screw this and reopen it. One advantage we have in this country, I'll consider it an advantage in this case over what happens in China and some other places, is we have a federalist system where the feds don't control public health decisions. They give guidelines. State by state by state has all the public health authority. And in most states like this one, they devolve that down to the local health department. So. By Friday, we had made the decision that first week that hell no, we were not gonna close all the schools. And we announced the same day, we were the first ones in the country along with Seattle King County to say, we're reopening our schools, this is done. That recommendation stayed in place for quite a while. Texas had, I think, I'm probably wrong here, but hundreds, maybe it was upwards of a thousand schools closed for several weeks. And it's just, if, if the guidance comes out, like they were talking earlier this week, to do that kind of thing, once we get community-wide spread here, that's gonna make no sense whatsoever. And the good news is, I'm the interim director on purpose. <laughs> I tried to retire, um, and, and I suck at retirement, so I'm here. Um, but what are they gonna do, fire me, you know? So, I, I, we will, in all likelihood, not be marching in lockstep once it's widespread in the United States. So that's that's for me. There you go. Thank you. Now, now we will hear. Now we will hear from Stephanie Innes, who, as you'll recall, is the healthcare reporter for the Arizona Republic. I think she has an interesting anecdote to tell us about. Hi, thanks. Yeah, I, I love the title of your uh, your workshop or whatever this uh, this is tonight. Um, 
about <laughs> hysteria um, because, you know, obviously that's something that we don't want to do if there's no reason for hysteria. But um, in the early days of this new coronavirus, um, there, there was the case that was confirmed in Washington State, I believe it was Tuesday, January 21st, I want to say. And that night, a woman in Phoenix started going all over Facebook, um, filmed herself saying, my child has coronavirus, and um, she's really sick, and she's in Phoenix Children's Hospital. And some of the media actually picked that up um, without checking with Phoenix Children's Hospital, which, of course, came to inform people that there are several strains of coronavirus, and there are only three that are actually really dangerous, one being this new uh, coronavirus. We were calling it new coronavirus at that point. Um, but, you know, by that point, that news had already gone out um, to some people, some listeners, um, some readers. And, um, you know, that's one, one thing that I can plug for having health reporters on staff because you know, I, I do think it's a bit of journalism 101. If somebody says their child is in the hospital for coronavirus, you check with that hospital, um, you know, and you check with the, the health department before you run with that, um, especially in some a case like this where people are really concerned. Um, and, you know, the media certainly doesn't want to be creating hysteria. Um, but I think there's sometimes a rush when there's a big story where people are wanting to post things quickly, um, get things out quickly, but it's really important to get it right, as right as you can, with a story that's changing all the time, like this one. And you know, I appreciated your analysis of the headlines and the, the stories, and I think from a journalist perspective, it's always tough to write these stories because we're getting changing information every day. Um, and, you know, sometimes people are saying this ha has a terrible mortality rate, other times not. But I think what journalists can do is present the facts with context. So, you know, if you want to say, well, this many people have died in China, well, we know that nobody's died in the United States of this. And we know that a at least 100 children, for instance, have died of flu this season alone. Um, so some of the people panicking might not have had their flu shot. So you can say to people, well, it's, it's important to get your flu shot. Or you could say, well, Arizona only has 16,000 licensed hospital beds and there's 7.1 million people in this state. What are we gonna do in a pandemic if 12% you know, of the people who get this are gonna need to be hospitalized? And what if 30% of the population is affected? And, you know, it's our job to go to the public health officials and they'll tell you, well, we have a plan for that. And there might be 16,000 licensed hospital beds, but there are unlicensed beds, which is not a bad thing. There's, there's beds that are in, say, ambulatory surgery centers. There's outpatient treatment centers. There's other beds that we can use if we need them, but let's, let's, let's keep, you know, keep this in context with what we know and what we know about the flu and what we know about coronavirus. Um, so, you know, we're, as the media, doing our best with a changing situation. I do know there is, with some publications, maybe a rush to, um, to publish information that, you know, as they get it. And, uh, you know, I guess the just, you know, just from my perspective, we're just, you know, trying to, to give people what we can. but also getting the truth. So I did have a chance to sit in on a graduate um, public health class at the University of Arizona up in Phoenix, and the instructor was saying to the people in the class, well, you know, we're gonna pretend that, that you're an official talking about the coronavirus, and just have three things, three messages that you wanna get out. And no matter what the reporter asks, you keep saying those same three things. And I said, well, <laughs> excuse me, but I don't agree with that. Um, you know, I think it's our job to give the truth um, and let the readers make up their minds. You know, we're not here to sanitize the truth and say, well, if everybody panics, they're gonna flood the ER rooms, so don't give them the information. No, I would rather say to the public, 
if you panic and there's a rush to the ER rooms, the hospitals aren't going to be able to treat the people who are really sick. And then people are aware of that and they can make up their own minds rather than us just saying don't panic. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Stephanie. Now we will have um, Dr. David Salafi, or Salafsky, who is the interim co-director and uh, co-executive director and the director of health promotion and preventive services at the University of Arizona um, Campus Health Service. So maybe you can give us an inside view on how the campus health is handling things yeah, and, sure. and what Thanks. students should know. Thank Absolutely. You. So um, I think probably a lot of you are aware that Campus Health, we're the on-campus medical clinic on campus. We also have counseling and site services. CAP is available through Campus Health. We have a health promotion office. You may have seen us do education and outreach on campus. What you may not know is that we actually do a lot of health-related policy and we work with a lot of uh, university stakeholders as well as um, our partners in the county to uh, address issues like such as this as they come up. You know, I, I first want to just thank everybody for, for putting this together. I think it's really valuable. I think we all depend on good journalism. We all depend on accurate information, and uh, we're all informed by it. And um, I think, you know, when we see a, an issue of this scale that comes up, it really takes people from across a lot of different disciplines to kind of come together to get good reporting, to get good science, um, to get a good response, and to get good education out to uh, people at large. So I think that's really important. Um, in terms of what we're doing at Campus Health, uh, one thing that I want to just point out, if you go to the Campus Health homepage, it's like a shameless plug here, but if you go to health.arizona.edu, you'll see uh, on the front page, you, coronavirus is on there. You can actually get lots of links to um, CDC resources. You can see uh, guidance, uh, advice for travelers, um, a lot of the rebel, relevant links. And we, we update that daily or more than daily at this point. So that's, that's a good one-stop shop for information on uh, coronavirus kind of through the lens of the university. Um, one thing that I'll also mention too is, um, even though we don't want to, you know, I know the theme with going viral, you know, we want to be very cautious about, you know, overreacting, but I think it's also important to use the time that we have to prepare and actually take action because we know that fear kind of activates that part of the brain that can be, you know, fight or flight and can be also kind of paralyzing at some point in time also, but we also want to use this time to kind of think through the what ifs. And that's not always an easy thing to do, it's not always a pleasant thing to do, but we also want to think about, you know, how would we be prepared? What are the things we would do? And, um, you know, I think as, um, as Bob mentioned, I think it's really good context to think about how this compares to flu. Um, I think the other thing with the reporting and that's really important to point out is that um, I think like you guys, we're often tracking the numbers every day. We'll wake up and read our news feed and look at, you know, how many cases, how many deaths. And I think that oftentimes gets equated with, you know, up to the minute journalism, but it doesn't always translate into the right information that we need to know. And I think, you know, Stephanie talked about contextualizing this, which I think is really important because I think the best articles that I've written are not just the live feeds on what the latest numbers are, the number of cases, because that can vary, you know, based on what the case definition is, as Bob mentioned, you know, how severe is the illness? If people are kind of getting mild uh, responses to it or, or not having any symptoms, maybe they're not, you know, being seen, they're not being counted. All these things play into the, the numbers at the end of the day. So um, I actually read a really interesting article maybe about a week ago by John Paulus with the New York Times, and he's, he did an op-ed. His background is actually mathematics. And he talked about, I think that the headline was, why the coronavirus numbers aren't what you think they are. And it kind of talks about how we count things as a huge impact on what the numbers actually look like. So, you know, the numbers kind of belie that a little bit. They, they seem like precise, exact, specific things. And if you put that number on it, but actually the way we got those numbers is actually pretty imprecise in some ways. We do our best to kind of count things the right way, make sure that we're only counting cases. But, um, you know, as we pointed out, there's a lot of things that go into that that can, can lead to the numbers being less than perfect. Um, I think what's more important, actually, is to kind of take a step further and, and, and contextualize this as well. There was another really good article by, um, I think, Stephanie Rosenthal in the Times. And she's, a, she's worked as a ER physician. She's also worked as a New York Times uh, correspondent. She was a correspondent um, in China during the SARS epidemic in the 
the early 2000s. And one of the things that she pointed out is when SARS was going on in the early 2000s, she actually had a young family at the time. She had two kids in school. They were kind of at an American international school in Beijing at the time. When that happened, um, there was a lot of fear. There was a lot of school closures. People were really concerned. There was a, a big response to that. Obviously, the case fatality rate was actually much higher. It was more like 10% um, compared to 2% or whatever we think it might be right now. But one of the things they mentioned is that one of the few schools that stayed open at that time in Beijing, the early 2000s during the SARS epidemic, was the American school. And um, they, did, they took it upon themselves to make sure that um, if kids got sick, they, they were not allowed to school. They, were, you know, they had to stay home. They were very vigilant about hand washing. Um, they did a lot of education with the kids. And something kind of remarkable happened, and she, she commented about this, at the end of the cold and flu season, not, had, not only had there not been a single case of SARS among any of the kids, fortunately, but actually there were no cases of flu or common colds. All these things that they usually dealt with in, in the flu season during the cold flu season, flu season kind of disappeared. And it was all about you know, getting those messages out there around hand washing, and it's all this kind of basic stuff that we, you know, we're probably tired of saying, tired of hearing, but we can't you know, stress that enough. And she said it was kind of a small miracle that that particular season that the kids didn't get sick. So I think that's, that's very important. Um, I think lastly, I'll just mention on, on the part of the university, you may be wondering, you know, you see the website, you kind of see, track some of that stuff, but you may be wondering what's going on at the university level. There's a lot of things going on behind the scenes that is, we're making sure that, you know, students, faculty, staff are safe. Um, you know, we live in a global world and the university is really a microcosm of that. Uh, we've got a big global presence and, you know, faculty and staff traveling everywhere and that's really important. But, um, so there's a lot of tracking that goes along with that. We work closely with our partners at the county health department around that. So there's a lot of work being done, even if you're not hearing about it on the day to day. And I think that's kind of important to, to kind of put out there. Um, I think that's most of the points that I had. I want to save some time for, for Q&A. Um, I think, you know, the tagline that I kind of mentioned, there was a panel a couple of weeks ago over at College of Public Health. I think the, the tagline, I'll just kind of reference that again, which is spread facts, not fear. Uh, we talked about the info epidemic, you know, there's the, kind of the disease itself, but there's also the fear factor and how that's leading to discrimination, to xenophobia, to bias. And I think that's maybe even a bigger threat right now. And I think it's good to, to address that in, in our everyday lives as well as kind of what we do um, in terms of journalistic work as well. Thank you very much. Now we will turn to a question and answer session. I'll pose questions, and then later the audience will also have a turn to ask questions. I think your, uh, Dr. Slavsky, your final statement was perfect because it leads into a series of questions I wanted to ask uh, about fear appeals. And fear appeals are uh, persuasive messages that attempt to arouse fear by emphasizing the potential danger and harm that will befall individuals if they do not adopt the messenger's recommendations. So this is for both the journalist and the the journalists and the medical professionals here on our panel. Um, what is the difference, do you think, between a fear appeal, you know, arousing those messages, um, arousing fear without good reason, and conveying reliable information? So where is that boundary? What should medical professionals and journalists do to make sure that that boundary is not breached? And I'll take answers from whoever wants to provide an answer. Oh, I can. Um, I was reading an article. Okay. I was reading an article this morning uh, on SARS, and it's called SARS Wars by an author named Barry magazine and she was looking at how that was presented um, it seems as though what she found was that if an expert presents information it's seen as and using strong language it's seen as the truth but you get to the point where even if the truth makes you afraid you're more likely to remember it. 
So it was kind of difficult to, I don't know, digest that because it's like, yeah, as a reporter, you're supposed to report the truth. And yes, people die from all kinds of diseases, but there's always that fear factor. And is it just to be able to get people to remember the story and if they hear it over and over again, you know, as an amplification, what's, what is the what is it that people actually remember when a message comes through that's actually you know reporting something that's hey you know this isn't as bad because that we originally thought it was are people going to hear it so that's it got me thinking about you know the, the amount of disease on the planet and what we should should really be careful about should we be afraid or should we wash our hands you know what kind of message are we trying to you know, get rid of here. So when you hear it over and over again, it just amplifies. Yeah. yeah, I would just add to that, and I think dovetail on that, is that you know, fear for fear's sake is not effective. Right. You know, I think anytime we're reporting on the numbers, I mean, there's a certain shock value to it. You know, um, you know the Casey Skyrock, Skyrock in China, well, that, you know, again, they could have, you know, surveillance just could have increased or, more aware of it or more tests were run, run on a particular day, whatever it might be. But I think, you know, on the journalism side, you know, give people some agency at the end of it, you know, rather than just saying fear for fear's sake, give people, you know, kind of a take home message. This is something practical that you can do and it's not necessarily stockpiling canned with goods, you know, at home. <laughs> you know, it could be, you know, just those those tried and true public health messages about hand washing, um, staying home if you're sick and um, you know, encouraging employers that you know to be okay, you know, send people home if they're if they're sick. All those kind of basic things, I think, are, are, are the most helpful. I'd, I'd like to address one. To, oh, 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 I was just going to add something really quickly. I, I agree with I really agree with what you say about giving people agency, and and I feel like we need to respect as journalists our listeners and our readers, um, and and listen to their fears and. You know, report accordingly, and I, I know in that first week, I mean, every day practically, at least every two hours, I was getting calls saying, "Why haven't you reported?" You know, my neighbor told me that there's a, a coronavirus case in Prescott, and you guys are falling down on the job. And and then they'd contact my publisher and say, "Your health reporter is terrible because she's not reporting this case." And so I call the state, and they're like. Why are you calling me again, Stephanie? <laughs> and I'd say, well, I'm just checking because I, you know, I got this report. So, um, but you know, respecting those fears and and then listening to people. Like I would listen to my friends and listen to, you know, people talking in coffee shops saying, well, I'm I'm traveling to Nebraska on a plane and I don't know, like, should I wear a mask? And so, <clears throat> you know, we've been starting to put in our stories that health officials say. You know, you wear a mask if you're sick and it protects other people, but that's not going to protect you from getting sick necessarily. Um, <clears throat> and we've mentioned, you know, what an N95 respirator is and why health officials wear those. And we've also explained quarantine versus isolation because I know that there was there were some questions about that. Um, but I think, like as journalists, listening to the community and then um, trying to answer them. Um, is, is always a good way of you know, sort of answering the fear question. Okay. So, yes, you can present things in more or less fearful terms, but to some extent we're all stuck with dealing with what we're stuck with. Risk perception is way different than I might mathematically calculate a risk. It's fine for us to sit up here and say, you know, it's no more risky than the flu. Um, and, well, think about this. Ebola fever terrified a whole lot of people who also would refuse to get a flu shot. It, you know, it, it's, <laughs> it's not the same to the how you feel it to, to how we might calculate it. So new diseases are scarier. Um, being, feeling out of control is scarier. Um, let me ask you, where are you more comfortable? In the driver's seat or in the passenger seat? 
almost yeah. everybody yeah. says in the driver's seat because you feel like you're in control. Well, think about this. You all know about normal distributions, right? If there is such a thing as an average driver, by definition, half of us are better off in the passenger seat. <laughs> so fear, you know, how you experience something is just way different. And this being new, being unknown, is just to a large extent inherently more fearful. So you've got to be extra careful how you present. Thank you very much. That's sure. very helpful. There's something, there are a couple of questions that I think a lot of people would like answers to, and this is directed to the public health officials. What is an epidemic? What is a pandemic? And what are the differences between the two? Um, it, uh, honest to God, it's all subjective. <laughs> uh, an outbreak is a bunch of cases of disease. An epidemic is when, oh, that looks like a bigger outbreak to me. Let's call it an epidemic. And a pandemic is something that goes all the way around the world, that basically the entire planet gets. Well, think about this. Every flu season, the flu goes all the way around the world. So in a way of thinking about it, every flu season is a pandemic. But we, but we don't call it that. Yeah, that's expected. So it's, it's a subjective uh, kind of term. And in a lot of ways, it's meaningless. Whether, whether this is ever officially declared a pandemic or not means zero difference to the communities that are dealing with community spread. So in other words, the words should not frighten us. Oh, yeah, but they do. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it feels different and there's nothing, in, to some extent, there's nothing we're gonna do about that for people who don't deal with the terms all the time. How, how can journalists be more responsible about using the terms? You know, I, I, I think it, it's, it, so you'll vouch for me on this. I do have <laughs> more than three quotes. Oh yeah. Do. Okay, so in my mind, it's our job to explain things in a way that you're not so much quoting me as understanding what the heck I'm trying to say, so that you can turn around and explain it to people who don't think the same way I do. Right. And, and, and so I think it's, uh, it's more on us in how we lay things out that, look, I've been the victim of horrible reporting, of course I have. Um, but most of the time, that's not the case. And most of the time I've seen my colleagues complain, it's been because they did a sucky job of explaining <laughs> something, and so it came out wrong. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, okay, that's a good I will say one, <laughs> one thing that just occurred to me, though, is when we're talking about the flu and coronavirus, there is a difference because there's a vaccine for the flu, right. and there is not one for the coronavirus, and I and there's also not a known treatment, right. um, and I think that that is also scaring people. Mm -hmm. yeah. Of course, it's scaring even the people who would never get the, a flu shot. I swear, this one this one is going to drive. I got to tell you, there's really good evidence out there that if we could get 80 percent of school age kids vaccinated we would take 90% of the flu season away from the rest of us. And instead of losing more than 20,000 people a year to the flu, you know, divide that by 10. That, that, it drives me nuts that we have such a good tool, but because it's a familiar disease and everyone is accustomed to it, it doesn't scare them enough to go out and do something. <laughs> well, I might get you back on your soapbox. So, to vaccines, and we all know about the vaccine autism scare and what that has done. Could you explain a little bit about, um, for those of you in the health, public health field, what that did as far as other types of vaccines? Oh, oh gosh. Hell yeah. How much time uh, do you have? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hell yeah. So, um, Herd immunity is a miracle. And to me, it's one of the most beautiful things in life, which probably says too much about me. <laughs> <laughs> but the fact that the reason I'm not worried about getting any of those 
diseases that used to be really, really common and circulate all the time right now in a room full of other people isn't so much the vaccines I ever got as it is the vaccines that you guys got. You're protecting me because you're not letting yourself be a link in the chain of infection to somebody else so that if my vaccine didn't work or for some reason I couldn't get it, I still don't. I never know whether my vaccine works because I never get exposed in the first place because we all have all done it together. We're losing that. We are literally on the cusp of seriously losing that. And I'll tell you, Pima County is in way better shape than Maricopa. Um, Maricopa County has the largest number of um, unimmunized kindergarten kids in the country. If you take our um, vaccine exemption rate and multiply it by the size of our population of new kids coming in every kindergarten year up there, the, the rate isn't the worst in the country, but because it's so huge, the numbers may put us over the top. So watch for this. If we get measles introduced into Metro Phoenix, in a way that it gets some real community spread going, it's gonna be more sustainable there than almost any place else. The measles outbreaks we've seen so far have been pockets of unimmunized folks in different places. It can go community-wide up there because we're down below our herd immunity threshold and you're gonna, you can see sustained spread instead of a short term <coughs> spread. More good news. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's what the irrational kind of fears do and that's why we so much need um, just reinforcements of, of um, messages. Dr. Swanski, yeah. do you have something? Yeah, just add? a short add on to that. I mean, I think public health, like journalism, depends on a foundation of trust. And when you get this kind of eroded, even you know by these means where you know a bogus article is written and it was shared and it spread like wildfire, I mean it creates huge problems. I mean I think also about the opioid epidemic too, where they kind of trace back. You could look at all the different studies on kind of safety around opioids. You may have seen this, but you trace it back to an article I think from the, the 90s, and it was. You know, it was referenced by everybody, and it was sort of snowballed, but if you actually go back to the article, it was a brief clinical note in a very controlled setting that wouldn't be, you know, replicated widely, and it really was an inaccurate way, and it was kind of a, you know, expanded upon, but at the, at the, the kernel of the safety argument that the pharmaceutical industry kind of stated, uh, was that, was this, Brief clinical note that wasn't really a full article that kind of spoke to that. So, I mean, that's the info epidemic kind of issue where sometimes bad information gets out and it spreads. And I think it's you know it's kind of all of our jobs to try to try to check that and nip it in the bud before it, it snowballs and turns into something bigger. Because you know, obviously with vaccines, I mean, we're talking about coronavirus and how we, we'd like to get a vaccine you know within a year or whatever that might be or as soon as possible. But we've got things that are so preventable but they're not being utilized, and that, that's, that's, a, that's a tragedy. So we have some questions from the audience. I don't think I your want. mic is on, Susie. Is that on? No. Am I speaking closely enough? I, yeah, I can hear you. You think it's on? Okay. okay. Yeah, the light is shining. Hopefully <laughs> it's on. So the first audience question is, why is there not more research on how long germs survive on objects? I think a lot of it, actually, if you look it up, um, uh, Kelly Reynolds at the University of Arizona in Public Health, she's done a lot of, a lot of this research. So there's actually a lot of local research here at the University of Arizona. Uh, if you look up Dr. Kelly Reynolds, she's done a lot of this. And actually, her articles, I'm on the public health um, listserv at any time. They have stories that are picked up by the media or um, uh, stories are written about um, you know, published articles um, that tends to be distributed through the listserv. But um, if you look her up, she's done a lot of stuff on, on this stuff. Dr. Gerba as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He's, yeah, he's done a lot of stuff. So there's actually been a lot of, a lot of research on that here at the university. Although. <laughs> <laughs> Although. 
um, for some <coughs> diseases, that's going to make sense and going to matter. Yeah. Norovirus, yeah. you know, things yeah. where touching the surface is a common way of transmitting right. um, something. For many of the diseases that get a lot of hype about how long something is, is survives on a surface, it doesn't matter. That's not how you're going to infect yourself. Yeah. It's, it's a so it, it depends yeah. on the on the organism and, and what. Thank you very much. Here's another question from the audience. This one is specifically addressed to Stephanie. And the uh, questioner is wondering, what was the discussion that went on at the Republic over naming the student at ASU with the disease? OK. Uh, well, I actually wasn't part of that discussion. Um, so I can't really say. Um, was there more, like, was there more to that question? You mean the fact that we didn't name the student? Is that what you're talking about? Or Wasn't the student named in the Republic, the ASU student? I didn't name the student. I don't know I don't if somebody the else did. Was Wasn't it name released? No. I mean, I've never named the student as far as, as, far as I'm aware. I know we had the student's name. It was a male. It was a male in his 20s. We have the student's name. Um, but the student never gave us authorization to release the name. And I'm just checking whether there was something changed that I don't know about yeah. that I think somebody relates. But yeah, any of my coverage has not named the student because, you know, that's a public health. They don't ever want to identify anything. I mean, even at first, they wouldn't tell us that the student was male um, or that the student was in his 20s. Actually, we don't even know it's a student. He's a member of the ASU community. Um, so there wasn't a discussion about naming the, the person because we don't name people. I mean, I write about all kinds of illnesses like hep A and, you know, um, H, new HIV cases, things like that, or, you know, things that are like maybe a, a, a mumps case or a measles case, and we would never name those people. Um, so, yeah, I just sometimes there's breaking news and I'm like, did we name that ASU student? person and I didn't know that but um, as far as I know uh, you know unless unless that person voluntarily came to us or we or we reach and I as far as I know we did reach out to the person and that individual did not want to share their name um, and and I do know that we had the name but um, as far as I know we you know that person may come forward in the future and then we would write about them if they wanted to share their story about what it was like in isolation um but you know that's not something that we would do i mean that breaches patient confidentiality so yeah stephanie hang on yeah. to the mic microphone yeah. for a second does that um, involve journalistic ethics for example the ethical pillar that the journalist should do no harm is that um, relevant here? I think there are certain rules that we have um, as journalists and in our own newsrooms, but like, for instance, sexual assault victims who are often named in court documents, we would never name them. Um, if the person is alleged to be a victim, uh, we wouldn't name them. Um, and then it's the same with these uh, illness issues. Um, you know, it's a public health a code that they are, are not identifying patients. And we tend to follow that unless the person willingly comes forward because they didn't do anything to be put in that position. And there's no, there's no real public interest in naming them. Um, and so we just don't. Um, I mean, I, that's the best I can offer, but um, yeah, that, you know, we often try to find out who these people are so we can ask them ourselves. We, that that's certainly happens, but we would never release a name just because we have the name. We have to get that person's permission. Thank yeah. you, Stephanie. This next audience question um, is for the public health people on the panel. What about people who don't believe in vaccines? How do public health officials handle the situation when they are sick? When, when they are sick. Yes. 
when those you mean, do we, do we say, yeah, yeah, we told you so? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no, look, um, uh, let me... There are a relatively small number of true anti-immunization advocates. There is a much, much larger group of parents, because we're mostly talking about childhood vaccines, mm -hmm. of parents who rightfully so look at all this stuff on the web and get scared and get worried. And they're, you know, nobody's ever to blame for their illness, but nobody's ever to blame for, for making the wrong decision based on being confused either. So um, in Arizona, we actually have among the loosest um, uh, statutes already for, for um, immunization requirements for school attendance. And um, the only bills that seem to move at all through the legislature that get a start anyway seem to be immunization bills that would make it even looser. So. Interesting. Dr. Dr. Solomsky, do you have a, yes. any additional comments? I think a lot of this it goes back to the trust issue. You know, I think when parents and individuals have a good relationship with a pediatrician or a physician, that you know that comes from position of trust and I think um, the, the information and how it's conveyed tends to be received pretty well. Um, I think on a societal level it's kind of interesting because I think several years ago there's an article published about this that looked at what were some of the motivators for people in terms of if they did not uh, get more, more on the vaccine schedule or were, were kind of perceived as anti-vax or had some attitudes around that. Um, they actually did like a randomized trial and they looked at different types of ways to deliver information mm -hmm. to these groups. And they actually found that a lot of the information, the way it's couched through the CDC or, you know, kind of official means, you know, didn't have a high degree of trust in this population. So the question then became, well, what do we do about that? I, you know, I kind of think of, you know, this is maybe not traditional, but I, I kind of think it's important to look at some other strategies to address this. Um, many of you will know, like, you know, Jenny McCarthy was sort of like the poster child for anti-vax. I think we need more celebrities saying, get vaccinated. You know, we got celebrities saying, you know, read books or, you know, um, you know talking about other things that are positive, pro-social kind of um, things. And I think maybe we need to take some different approaches to this rather than just say, hey, you know, go to the official sources. You know, if until we can rebuild some of that trust, not to, uh, across the society at large, but in some of these pockets of the population where there is some of that distrust, what are some of the things that mo might motivate them? Maybe we could even, you know, I could see see somebody doing a campaign where I was an anti-vaxxer and then I changed my mind. I think that would be really powerful. Um, so what are the things we can do to, to kind of get that message across? Thank you. There's another audience question, and um, this sounds like it's addressed to Stephanie, but if the other folks would like to comment, that's great too. Do you think the angle of access to information or transparency should be covered more or less? And this is, I think, regarding the individual who found the virus early on, the incident in China, where he was punished. Oh, yeah, I mean, that's, you know, that's international reporting, but yeah, I mean, I, I definitely think, you know, that one quote in one of the articles that Laura said where, you know, it shouldn't be one person giving out information, and I think that's absolutely true. You need information from all different kinds of people when you're reporting on something like this. I mean, if, you know, even just reporting on new coronavirus in Phoenix, we don't just rely on one person. We talk to, you know, people in the general public, we talk to public health officials, we talk to people in pharmacies, uh, we talk to, you know, people who may be critical of the public health officials and what they're telling us. Um, so, yeah, I think that the transparency issue has been a, one of the biggest problems with new coronavirus and what's coming out of China because I know as a reporter, I still don't know why did that doctor in his 30s die? I mean, I, maybe some of the public officials, public health officials here can tell me that. But, you know, I, I keep seeing, well, 
you know, some of the deaths are because people are older, they're um, immunocompromised, they have un underlying health conditions, but that doesn't explain to me why these young doctors in their 30s are dying, and what does that mean for a new coronavirus coming here? Those, that's a question that I have not heard a sufficient answer to, um, and I don't know if anyone here knows the answer to that, but I, I think that that transparency is one of the biggest problems with this story, and that's why it's causing some of the fear that it is. I think if we had better information coming out of China, that maybe there wouldn't be so much fear. Can I take a guess? <laughs> um, a few things. First of all, uh, young, healthy people die of the flu every year, just a smaller number. Secondly, healthcare workers who are getting exposed all the time, especially, I'm guessing, early on when they probably didn't have the personal protective equipment that they might have needed, um, probably got a whopping loading dose yeah. too. Repeated exposure and a lot. It, that's a guess. But um, yeah, the, the folks who are, just like your little video showed, the folks who are gonna be most at risk are family members over and over and over. No. The other thing with the healthcare workers, um, I think that they were beginning Sorry. to be overworked and stress and yeah. fatigue sure. and yeah. your immune system oh, goes down. Yeah. So somebody who's healthy in their, in their 30s, you get to the point where you're just so tired and you know how important sleep is. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll vote for that. I lost yeah. several years of my life in the pandemic, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, the combination of constant exposure and, and just yeah, sleep, I answer. think that yeah. that would just bring anybody down. I, I, I talk to students every day. I do have a question as long as I have the microphone. <laughs> this you might be able to answer. The word is going around now about all of the study abroad sessions that are being canceled yeah. and, you know, in different colleges. And um, I was talking to a student today um, about that and people being stuck and not worried about that they're not going to be able to complete their semester yeah. if they go study abroad. Um, how would you respond to that um, from a campus standpoint? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's a good question. I'm sure it's on a lot of people's minds. Well, you know, last month we you know, suspended all kind of official travel in China, um, as everybody knows, and, and that message kind of went out. Um, one thing that I can say right now is that we're reviewing kind of, you know, in other countries, um, you know, what's the best information that we have? What's the perceived risk? You know, where are the universities? and proximity to where uh, the, you know the outbreaks are and kind of weighing that risk so I think um, you'll probably be hearing more information soon on that mm -hmm. but it's certainly UA Global has been just an incredible partner in this and they've, they've really been actively looking at um, what the risk is and you know not only the, the risk of coronavirus like as you mentioned uh, you know people may do fine in the country but if there's ongoing uh, issues and you know, you can't get out of there, um, that creates further kind of downstream problems. So we're thinking about all those things and kind of weighing that um, to make a recommendation for senior leadership to, to make, it, make a call about that. Yeah, it's a good question. Thank you, great question. There's another question from the audience, which is really interesting. The person asks, University of Arizona employees don't need to be immunized, but students do. What is the rationale behind that decision? Yeah. Oh, I can speak to you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Fair warning. All right, so yeah, as I think as everybody knows, there's an MMR requirement for incoming students, and that's been in place for many, many years. I think I think back in the 80s, there was maybe one dose of MMR, but you know, it's been two doses for maybe 30 years at this point. Um, but you know, when we saw you know measles uh, in the state, we were concerned about this and we, we actually looked at some of the medical records and ran some of the numbers and the thing that we found that for measles specifically, we have a, over 99% compliance rate for, for measles for all U of A students, um, which is great and it's really good and you know we can actually go back to those records and we can see that. Um, 
the interesting thing is when we ran those numbers, we found that you know some of those people had kind of um, exemptions or declinations, and we actually followed up with them um, when there was a case because we thought, hey, this might be a call to action. We could actually close the gap for that remaining less than one percent. So it actually, well, people people did come in and get immunized, and um, you know there were huge numbers, but we're talking relatively few numbers of students overall. So. I think the bottom line is for, for students, we got really good coverage for, for measles and from NMR. The, the question though, I think is a really good one, what, is what about employees? And I think recently there's been, as measles has kind of cropped up around the country um, and we're seeing more cases now, there's more of a discussion of like, you know, what's the role of the workplace? What's the role of the employer in asking for that? I mean, we're, we're kind of not there yet, but I think it's a really good question to ask and I'd love to see more initiative and more push toward that because we, we would certainly support it. So I'm just going to say most of the people who work here have advanced degrees and were students for a long time. Yeah. Now as well. yeah. So they've complied at least to some level. Yeah. We have a faculty member today has an op-ed going national asking why airlines don't require vaccination records for travelers. Will you ask that again? I didn't hear it. She's got a mic. Mm. We have a faculty member from the School of Law and he has a colleague from an elder in the School of Law today have a op-ed that's going around the country asking why airlines don't require vaccination mm -hmm. records for passengers. Mm -hmm. You require it for foreign travel, why don't you require it to get on a plane? Yeah, now we're going to the ID Plus system in October, you know, so a lot of things are changing with that, so you never know, I mean, that could be a change. But yeah, Chris makes a good point is that you know, it'd be kind of interesting to look at the, you know, across the university, what percentage of people, you know, have a, a degree, and, you know, they probably complied at some point, but we're just not tracking it. Um, but it, it's a good question. Oh, we, yeah. we know. Yeah. <laughs> but in terms of, uh, in terms of, you know. I was the person, I was the person who asked you that question. Yeah. Because I was a professor for 27 years, so I have a bunch of those advanced degrees. And I had to get an MMR when I came to the UA to begin with in 1970 something. Um, and then as soon as I, I work with students every day, tutor, tutor students, and then as soon as I became a student, I got that letter, congratulations, you just got accepted to law school, now go get your MMR shot. <laughs> um, so at the age of 59, which is what I was then, I went over to the student health and got my shot. Um, but it seemed to me that <clears throat> It, it, it was fine to do that, but it's, it still seems to me that it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense that there are people maybe my age who are doing things like this and are not immunized. It's a great question and comment. Okay. So, um, how many employees, every year there's a campaign for flu shots, how many employees are actually getting those shots? One. And um, uh, two, I think um, last week you and I were involved in some discussions about whether there would, should be a, a spring campaign about it's not too late to get your flu shot. Is that gonna happen? Yeah. On the mall? We've done it before. And we, we actually, I'm, I'm proud to announce here that this year we had, uh, we took things up a notch. We actually had a competition with ASU and NEU because we thought if there was one thing that's going to get people to get their flu shots, it's to beat ASU. Yeah. And um, happy to report that we did. So we won the championship for the most flu shots delivered. And uh, that was for students. And um, obviously we can't, it's hard for us, we can't count if they go to Walgreens or CVS or to their primary care. But among all, you know, all the health, um, centers across the three camp universities uh, track this and uh, yeah we were in the lead so that's I think so now we actually throw a pizza party for the staff to congratulate them on, on beating ASU so um, that's been good but I, in terms of the exact numbers I don't know I know that our travel and immunization clinic at campus health it's not only heavy, heavily utilized by, by students but also faculty and staff as well and I think um, you know those numbers are probably pretty significant, I don't know exactly. I will do a plug also to say that I think we have probably over 100 doses of flu still left or a little bit more than that. So if you know anybody who hasn't got their flu shot, it's not too late. Happy to do that. <laughs> well, it's slapped them around for waiting this long. Because <laughs> yeah, they missed most of yeah. the benefit yeah. of the vaccine. Yeah. You know, you get it earlier. Yeah. yeah it, 
I think well, sometimes there's a concern that people don't like get it too early, and we're trying to counter that myth. No. Yeah. Yeah. We just didn't know what we were talking about. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have a question for you, and hopefully I think you can answer this. I was in Walgreens. This is I did go to student health, got my flu shot. But I was in Walgreens last year, and I was talking to the nurse, and I said, so what's up with the flu shot? So she told me that in May, basically the last case of flu, they take that virus from whoever it is, and then they diddle around with it over the summer, and then they use that. The technical for, term. For, yeah. <laughs> and then they use that um, for the next season of flu to do all the vaccines. Oh, is that God. something that you would do? <laughs> 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 No. <laughs> so, of the, the fraction of folks who get um, uh, testing done, where they actually, where they, um, certain facilities will actually grab viral cultures for us so that we can see what strains are circulating, you will have predominant strains each year and you will have minor strains each year. And they try to guess by. February, I think it is, what next year's strains are most likely to be. They use that evidence and they use what happened in the previous, our summer, their winter in the Southern Hemisphere to kind of drive what do we think the predominant strains next year are gonna be. And then they try to match what they can grow in a lab to what they expect, but some of those strains don't grow well, so sometimes you can't, even if you think this is the one you're gonna have, you have to pick something else that you think has good cross-reactivity because you can grow this one up in agriculture or, or, or cell culture and you can't with the, with the one that you actually expect. It's a crapshoot. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it, look, the flu vaccine it is among our less effective vaccines and we all wish it was better. But flu is also not wildly infectious. Um, the R naught, the transmission rate from flu community-wide isn't that high. So you can get decent herd immunity even with a vaccine that sucks compared to other vaccines and, and still wind up taking most of the season away if we could just get people to use it. I have another question. I'm sorry to take this over, but these questions are bothering me I, as soon as I have you here. <laughs> How do you respond to, I got the flu shot, but I got the flu anyway? Yeah. Okay. I got the flu shot, Everybody says that. <laughs> so lots of people say that. Um, I am sure that there is the occasional person who will feel run down after flu vaccine. I know that's the case with the senior flu vaccine, which has a much higher uh, dose, if you will, of antigens that people are getting. Um, but... For most folks who say that, they've done placebo-controlled double-blind trials and given half of people saline and half of people flu vaccine and then asked them, how many of you felt run down? How many of you had a headache? How many of you had a sore throat? All this, and they're almost <coughs> identical all the time. So occasionally it happens, but not very often. What does happen a lot is People wait until this time of year or last month and they see the guy in the cube next to them hacking their lungs out <laughs> and they say, oh, I better go get a flu shot. <laughs> well, it takes a few weeks to build antibody to the flu vaccine. So if the guy next to you was hacking his lungs out, guess what? You just got infected. You go run out, get your shot, get sick as a dog a day later because you got the flu and blame the vaccine and never take it again as long as you like. I mean, that's sort of the classic yeah. pattern and I've heard it <laughs> plenty of times. Um, I, I don't know if you want to add yeah. anything. Were you also asking about the fact that people got the flu shot but then got then sick got later, yeah. not, not necessarily from yeah, the flu the, shot? Oh but, no, I got oh. the flu shot. I got the flu from the flu shot. Okay, yeah. I was not sure if you also kind of talked about people saying, you know, I got the flu shot and I still got the flu later in the yeah. season. Oh yeah, that's true. Yeah, and that happens. That happens but, 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 but we know that severity is probably less and they're not quite as sick and they may not even have the flu. <laughs> yeah. Back of the matter, they may, may have gotten sick from something else. So yeah, that's a good question. If, if we don't have another question, I want to ask this group 
So go ahead. So for this issue, um, <coughs> Pacheco, our, our uh, uh, community relations uh, program manager, is back here, um, and uh, and for me as well. What do you need us to do to make it easier to write stories on this? What 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 do we need to do so that you can help people understand without? Oh, you want me to answer? <laughs> I, I can answer that. I mean, you, you're you kind of the exception because you're accessible and you also explain things. But it's incredibly hard to get some of these public health officials, and I'm sure mm -hmm. any of the journalism students in this room would agree. Um, you know, and, and people will say, well, I'll only answer your questions in writing, which really takes, you know, <laughs> it, it's terrible because you don't, you may not understand what they reply to you and then you have to write back and then they may take, you know, a few more hours to get back with you or maybe they don't even get back with you and you don't understand what they said and it could have been taken care of in a 10 minute conversation. Um, and I, I just, I fail to understand why people go into public health and they don't want to communicate with the public. That's just, you know, and I've had a real problem in, in Phoenix with some of this with the coronavirus. So, yeah. Um, so I'm sure that, I'm sure that everyone here has their own experiences to share. So, So if you call the U of A right now and ask what are we doing about the coronavirus and preparations and the rest of it, we can't talk to you. Ah. We're a state institution. When the governor declared the state of emergency, we went into incident command. And so therefore, we have to refer everybody to Chris Minnick at the Arizona Department of Health Studies. And that's just the way that is. People think we're trying to evade them or be elusive and we don't have any choice on that. Now, if it's things that are not part of the in-state Arizona response, like how are our students in China doing, do we have any kids in Italy or wherever, uh, we can answer those, and we will. Brent White with Global, Jill Calderon's been answering questions all week about uh, what are we doing for students in China who can't come back here, uh, and so forth. Then I also get questions from, working with Stephanie is a blessing. She's a health reporter, she knows the rules, she's good at it, and, and there is, if not an ethics, there is a practice that they follow. Uh, I get questions from people who may have not been on the job a long time, uh, maybe worked on TV, never covered the health, anything. And they're saying, well, um, are you pulling kids out of study abroad in, for health concerns? And if not, why not? So she's basically started with the conclusion that we need to be shutting down study abroad. That's a hard question for us to answer. Because whatever we say, we're going to be wrong, if that's the way she feels. Interesting. But if reporters will let the story tell them where to go, rather than tell the story where to go, we all do better. And I, I would just add to that too, like, you know, um, we try to be really accessible with campus health, and I talk to at least a couple of journalism students every week on every topic you can imagine, <laughs> from <laughs> STDs to alcohol to sleep to you name it, e-cigarettes, jewels, <laughs> recently. Um, so we try to be really accessible for that, and not just obviously for our journalism students here, but um, really, you know, the star and uh, local TV, um, any media outlets that are, you know, have an interest in covering student health. Um, we love talking to people, so. Except when you can't. Except when Chris tells us. Any other questions? Yeah, Chris. Yeah, so do we have any other audience questions? I'll, I'll, I'll tell you guys something before I lose my chance. In the back of the room, I've got a few handouts. One is an op-ed that um, I co-authored that got into the Republic this week. 
um, and two others are also, they're all editorials, none of them are articles, um, from Tom Freedom, uh, Tom Freedom, who used to be head of CDC, and Mike Foster Holm, just for perspective on some of this stuff, if you want, sort of for background. There are a couple of tip sheets too, <clears throat> prepared by faculty in the School of Journalism on uh, what to do and not to do when covering science topics. Mm -hmm. So be sure to go check those out on that back table. Cool. You might have missed the couple, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was on, I think. Oh, okay. I have a question about the Diamond Princess, the cruise ship. Yeah. Now there's the fear out there about San Antonio, too many people died, I guess, that had come off that cruise ship. So why are cruise ships so, not, I don't want to say dangerous, but. Germy? Germy, yeah. <laughs> I mean, people have, I've been on a cruise ship. People have their own cabins and their own bathrooms. So is it just spreading in the general area? <coughs> I'm sure you're lost in this, but I think it, you know, it's, it's probably a much bigger risk factor than flying because of the duration and the proximity. And people are basically living together. And you know, one of the things we look at is the risk factors. It's healthcare workers and household contacts. And you're basically kind of a household contact when you're on a floating ship with somebody. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of like a dorm. Yeah. You're, you're, you're um, eating together. You're taking the same stairways and hang with the handrails up and down as with everybody else or you're in you know the ballrooms together or whatever it is and some infectious disease back to the ones that survive on surfaces like norovirus just go nuts on a setting like that but other congregate settings are going to be issues too when these cases show up in the jail and in the prisons um, and in shelters, it, it's going to be <coughs> nasty. Um, the other thing with that with that cruise ship, it taught. I think it taught us something about quarantine. That if you keep people together yeah. while you're quarantining them, and one person has is incubating the disease, then it's just going to go on and on and on. So if you're going to quarantine folks, you have to social distance. <clears throat> That's what I think the public thought had happened, that they were isolated. You know, I think people thought that those quarantine people were isolated from each other, but yeah. I guess not. I saw, I, you know, probably read the same stuff you did, where yeah. you saw people sitting around playing cards together oh. while they're waiting things out. So I think even activity is still continued. Yeah. 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 They got Sorry. together. Okay, here's another audience question. Hand washing is good. What about hand sanitizers? Yeah. Are they good, any good? Or is that a great question. If, if you use hand sanitizers with 70% alcohol, um, that's good against most stuff. Not everything. Um, the advantage of hand sanitizers, hand washing is great. Do it all the time. If you work in a profession, where you have to wash your hands all day long every 10 minutes between patients for example in a clinic it can get to the point where you're not really doing it or so the advantage of hand sanitizers when they've done studies is that healthcare workers will actually use it yeah um, or if you're in a setting where you don't have the running water and the soap or you have to wash your hands a lot it's an alternative it's probably not as good as just washing your hands. Um, but in some settings, because it was used, it actually resulted in better outcomes mm -hmm. in, in hospitals. So it's sort of like that intent to treat analysis um, for that. But use the ones with alcohol. Don't use the antibacterial crap that, you know, is, isn't alcoholic. It's so I have um, a follow-up question for Stephanie. Yeah, sure. And I'm, I'm noticing that Chris Minnick is calling me right now, so maybe he's watching this. <laughs> <laughs> we have a call-in question. Yeah. Go ahead, Stephanie, it. take it. We'll wait. Yeah. Hey, Chris, how are you? <laughs> 
Oh, it is? Okay. Okay. It's a little more complex. Okay. Okay. Did you see the other question I sent you later today? Okay. <laughs> questions about say if 30% of the population had this and 12% need to be hospitalized, do we have enough hospital beds for them? Okay. Okay. Sounds like it's a good story. It's a great 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 story. Okay, all right, that's great. Notice journalism students, how persistent she's being about staying on that call and getting her information. <coughs> right, <laughs> Professor Knight? Right, yeah. Yes, can we get that? Tomorrow? It's modeling. Okay. You never want to okay. hang up on the source. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Chris. Okay. Thanks a lot. <laughs> So I, I will say I've been asking about budget numbers because when I talked about you know going into public health and being accessible, one of the things that occurred to me is that these public health departments seem very strained um, by, uh, constrained at least by budget. And I wondered if that was part of the reason that they're paying so much attention to trying to address what's going on and that maybe they don't always have time you know, if, especially if they have people in isolation like in Maricopa County in quarantine, that, you know, maybe they don't have enough funds to address this if, if there is, in the event, a, a lot of patients out there. So I've been asking about budget numbers, so that's what that was about. Um, well, thanks yeah. for modeling for our students. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for letting me share yeah. all of the medical yeah. I know, I know. I, especially <laughs> after you said how hard it was for, to yeah, get a hold of somebody like that. I know, and then here he calls, and so calls, I feel like yeah. I've been, I, yeah. I, he's, he's sort of denounced what I just said. He, was, he wasn't <laughs> asking for it in an email, yeah. so. <laughs> no, our, our pleasure to give you that time to get the rest of your story. Yes, it, it's great. You should never hang up on a source going to talk to you. It's, it's, it's very true, so I really appreciate that, yeah. that latitude that you gave. This is what happens when it's a bunch of journalists. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever seen the shanty go completely quiet because a journalist is taking a phone call? <laughs> the shanty's a bar. <laughs> so, Stephanie, do you have any other tips for new or young journalists, people new to the profession? Oh, well, I think, um, you know, something that we do, uh, that I often do is I'll take like a subject and then I draw little circles out of it, sort of how many different sources can I talk to about this? Because you want to like go on Reddit, on Facebook, on Twitter, and all these places to see, get a gauge of what people are talking about. Um, and that will make your stories more relevant um, to your audience and also you get an idea of the questions that people ask. Because I always consider myself, like these are the smart people and I'm translating for everybody <laughs> else, but I, I want to know um, what people are talking about and what they need to know. And I think you all are in a really great position for that because you're students and you know, you're talking to people in the university who um, maybe travel a lot or maybe they're going abroad. And um, so you've got some really great sources at your fingertips that like I don't have. Um, um, and you know, listening to fellow students talk. So, and, I, and also just using your instincts, like what are you worried about? Um, so I think that would be, oh, and also just press health officials if they don't answer you right away. Um, often they'll end up calling you back at, at 8 o'clock at night. At, at the night and, you know, um, and yeah, proving my, my uh, statement about their lack of response. So, so, yeah, that's fair. Thank you very much. Does anyone else on the panel have anything they would like to add? For example, the 
public health people. Do you have advice for inexperienced journalists who want to learn how to ask the right questions and follow up and be persistent? Any advice? I, yeah, I think you just said it. I think be persistent and um, you know talk to a lot of people. And um, I think uh, one of the things that we try to do at Campus Health, we do an annual health and wellness survey every spring semester, which is a real good kind of um, overall kind of trend of what's going on among this population. We've done it actually going back to the 90s and done it every year. And one of the things that we try to do is make a lot of that information accessible to people. So um, we, we see that, you know, we, we go out to classrooms every spring semester, we collect the data, and um, we feel strongly that that's the student's data because that wouldn't be there without their participation. So we try to make it as accessible as possible. And, you know, I mean, it's just one kind of example, but one thing that we found is really helpful is making that um, available online. And, you know, at least on the student side, a lot of people find us through that. And, um, you know, people are looking for, you know, numbers and accurate numbers. And um, that's often a, a way that students actually find us and reach out to us for, for, uh, for interviews. So, but I, I think it's, it's hugely important. We all depend on good journalism, as I mentioned at the beginning, and we're, we're almost always uh, happy to, to talk to uh, journalists in, in any way that we can be helpful. Yeah, I, I, I think it goes both ways. Build some relationships with people. Get to know who, who you trust um, in, in both directions. Let us talk to you on background enough so that you understand what we're trying to mm -hmm. say before you get around to trying to put it into a quote of some kind. <laughs> and in the I will also talk to people off the record, which a lot of my colleagues will actually teach never do that, you know? But I will. And if you get somebody to do that, honor that. One time early in my career, I did that, and my quote was in the, on the front page of the paper the next day. They didn't attribute it, but... Um, <laughs> and, and, but I have a certain way of talking, you know? So the people around me recognized right away. <laughs> and people were walking past me in the hallway going, deep throat, you know? <laughs> so watch that. Don't, don't do that to somebody. <laughs> Any other questions? From um, I have one. Oh. Thank you. Um, this question might seem redundant, but as far as like identifying ourselves when interviewing public officials, um, our you know our professors teach us that we have to say, "Hi, my name is whatever. Um, I'm a student journalist," and I get the feeling that you know we have to get a quote for you know an assignment. You have to get a quote, so you know you try to get it as hard as you can. But sometimes it happens that oh, you identify yourself as a student, and immediately you feel that the conversation winds down and you don't feel that they're going to you know give you the information that you want rather than take you to you know transfer you to some someone else well yeah and i i kind of see it another way too is that they could actually tell you more because you're a student that maybe they're like well i'm not going to wind up in you know in a major publication but yeah, I think that you need to be persistent about that. Um, but I do think it, it can be harder as a student um, getting quotations um, because, yeah, people don't feel that pressure where they're going to get quoted in the paper saying, you know, Dr. England refused to respond to our questions um, because that's going to wind up in print, whereas they don't, if you're a student, that maybe there isn't that pressure on them. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know, do you have any other, because I think if you get transferred to like an epidemiologist instead of say the director of the department, I don't think that's a bad thing. Like sometimes, sometimes people are closer to the ground can give you even better information. Um, and that, you know, that diversity of sourcing can actually be a good thing, but yeah. you might have yeah. better yeah, well, one thing I actually like about Pima County compared to Maricopa County, where I was before, I did a lot of talking in Maricopa County. Oh, yeah. 
I was, you know, you I was. You took my calls from Tucson when I was recruiting down here. Well, sure, but <laughs> I, but we, um, I was sort of the face, right? I got people all knew me. I couldn't go anywhere. I couldn't go to a bar without people recognizing me and going, "Oh, hi, how are you doing?" And I go, "Oh, great, good. How are you?" <laughs> um, and. Um, but here, there was already a well-ingrained pattern of program people who know the most about what they're talking about, being prepared to talk to the media. And, you know, Aaron wouldn't even ask me, you know, if it was, if it was regarding a particular program or somebody could speak to it really well, that's just where the, that's just where the story would go. And frankly, you get better, you get better information now. I think because you have people closer to the subject matter who can really know how to do it, unless you've got a program per person who doesn't know how to talk, which is a whole other thing, which is a skill some people can do and some people can't. Oh, and I have one other suggestion too: um, is if you can, if you have the time and, and offer to meet the person in, in person and say, "I would like my first preference is for an in-person interview," they're often going to. You know, you're going to get better information that way, and they'll they'll realize that you're serious. And what do you think about that? Yeah, I, I always prefer to do things in person if I yeah. can, because sometimes they'll get more chatty. Um, mm -hmm. If you have the time, because often you don't have the time, right? But um, and often the other person doesn't have the time. But right. That's the yeah. Thing. That that could be right. the bigger issue. But yeah. Well, I, I agree with you, Stephanie. <coughs> I always tell my students. My preference is that you get in-person interviews because you miss things. You can't develop the relationship as well. Um, you also might see interesting things on the wall of the person's office that will lead to um, more interesting things. Very, yes, that's a very good tip. So yeah. I always tell yeah. them that you really should go talk to them. Yeah. Plus, they need to get over the fear of interviewing people in person. And some professors will have you in that little spiel you give at the beginning. My name is Susan Knight. Mm -hmm. I'm writing a story on XYZ. And if they say, because they've picked up that you're a student, well, is this gonna be published? I tell my students to always say, I'm a journalist, I would hope that anything I write could be published. So that you're leaving it open, mm -hmm. you know, and, mm -hmm. and they realize that this, you know, is a serious interview. Mm -hmm. I, I tell my students not to say I'm writing a story for a class, because yeah. that's gonna turn them off mm -hmm. and uh, you know, one, I get emails all the time from people asking me questions and they really want me to do their homework. Mm -hmm. You know, so sometimes officials will react that way. So if you kind of just approach it, my name is Susan Knight, I'm working on a story on coronavirus at the University of Arizona. And let them ask, at some point, if you don't have a publication to, mm -hmm. to say that you're working for, let them ask, well, you know, where is this going to be published? Who are you working for? But if you say, you know, I'm a student at the University of Arizona working on a story on blah, 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 you know, mm -hmm. you yeah. kind of gloss over that. Yeah, but we get not so much from journalism students, but other students, we get hit on all the time that for do my homework kind of mm -hmm. projects. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I need, I, it's a class assignment, I've got to interview a public health official, you know. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and they do tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> you can do the statistics on X, Y, Z. Yeah. Right, that, that's true. And I also always tell my students, do your homework. So read the website, find out about the person, what's their title, where did they go to school, what's their area of expertise. So if you are prepared and appear to be and are knowledgeable, the person's more likely to talk to you, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, exude confidence because you have information. Or the subject matter. Mm -hmm. You know, the, what you're gonna ask about, you know something. That was the, the rising into authority. <laughs> uh, we should probably wind it down because we uh, had a reservation. Do we have another question or? Do you wanna say? I was just gonna add oh. that sometimes um, you might find, yeah, sure. <clears throat> Just as far as that initial transfer on the phone, sometimes you, uh, oh, very often, especially for students, you're trying really hard to find the right place through the door, and a lot of times that transfer, what you're 
hoping to get to is going to be that public information officer. The, in, you know, for us, it's community relation officer. Um, once you're able to, to navigate towards that person, hold on to their contact information. Um, because just like the way that we're set up here in Pima County, we're going to try our best to funnel you, if not to the right place within our agency, to the right place within a different agency. Um, so it, it's all about, about creating those relationships and, um, and maintaining them, even as a student journalist, um, with, those, with those communication folks. Awesome. All right. I want to thank all of our speakers. Thank you. Thank you so much for participating. Thank you all for coming. There are materials in the